Good afternoon. I would like to uh, thank all of you as fellow learners for joining us in this space uh, to build community through learning and the acquisition of wisdom. Uh, we are delighted uh, to be exploring the topic of a book titled The First Family, Innocence, Awareness, and Strength and Estrangement. It's a very provocative title that harkens to our primordial spiritual ancestors, Adam and Eve, and the vision that we all share with the Genesis writer of the world that should be uh, right with peace, love, and co cooperation and coexistence. Um, we are super delighted that the um, author of this book and one of the presenters of this book, Dr. Chris Chilton, will be leading us in our conversation. After I introduce him, he's going to properly acknowledge others who have collaborated with him in his scholarship and in his process uh, and his journey. Um, we all know Dr. Chilton uh, is the Bernard Giddings Bell Professor of Religion at Bart College and the Executive Director of the Institute of Advanced Theology at Bart College. With more than his impressive titles and his credentials, we know that he is um, a preeminent intellectual biblical scholar covering a broad range of complex topics and explaining it to us with such lucidity um, that reminds us the importance of having religious um, discourse in this day and age to help us untangle difficult problems. Uh, Dr. Chilton is a purveyor of wisdom, of religious thought, a community leader, and some of his notable books are Rabbi Jesus, Mary Magdalene, uh, Abraham's Curse, and a slew of other uh, well-regarded uh, scholarly books that many of us have been fortunate to journey with him as he's published them and has lectured to us on them. So with no further ado, I'll leave you with Dr. Bruce Chilton, who in turn will introduce to us others who will share before he uh, launches into his presentation. Thank you very much, Luis, and thank you for your collaboration and friendship over the years. The work of theology is always collaborative in the sense that it requires conversation and an exchange of ideas. Luis has been key in that, but the particular book we're looking at, First Family, is more collaborative than most. It comes out of the work of the Institute of Advanced Theology at Bard College. Uh, we have just finished a discussion of a different topic over the course of the past season that is called the divisions that divide us. That is, what is it that we keep arguing about for about two millennia that doesn't appear to go away, and why are those divisions there? If you could think of anything more provocative, please let me know, because we're looking into the question of what to discuss next autumn, even now. I've agreed that after the session today, I'll be meeting with our administrator in order to determine what we'll do next autumn. But this particular book happened as we were weaving our way through the pandemic. We were using various kinds of technology, and I had been in a long discussion with another alumnus of Bard College, Laszlo Beto, who had just written a fictional work on the opening of the book of Genesis. And as he was developing that, he and I were discussing how historically we could look at the book of Genesis, which has been the purpose of First Family. It's a work of excavation in the sense that we are starting with the ground level of the Bible. That is, we're not asking how it read when everything went together and the moving parts were meshing. We ask the question, what at the earliest stages did the biblical composers involved understand about Eden. And in order to explore that, I was delighted that I was joined by Kenneth Wapner, who is my editor for this book, and has been for others. Those works that Luis referred to 
were all done with the collaboration of Ken Walker. And we've actually produced it through Natus Books. We have the publisher here, Sam Truitt. Uh, I have always looked yearningly far down south from Annandale all the way to Barrytown, <laughs> wondering whether Barrytown would ever cover anything that I did. And so here it is, that undergraduate dream has been realized, and I think it's a wonderful thing. So Ken has agreed to speak on behalf of both himself and Sam, and after that I'll explore some of the ideas of this book with you. Uh, thank you, Bruce, for that warm acknowledgement, and uh, I have indeed worked with Bruce for a long time now. It feels like many, many years, and we've done projects together, and he's enriched my life greatly and my mind, and as you know, he's incredibly articulate, and his scholarship is just first rate, really world class. So this book came about, uh, for me, I think because of two trees. We don't talk about it that much in this book, but the genesis of the book for me in an editorial sense was that Bruce mentioned in an offhand comment, oh yeah, there are two trees in Eden, right? We all know the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but there's also the tree of life. And I thought, oh, I've never realized there are two trees. How interesting. And maybe there are other things, too, that I've just assumed in the book itself, in the text, the biblical text, that I don't really understand and want to understand more about. And I think that's how we really came to develop the book and the idea. So Sam and I, uh, uh, the publisher here of, of Natus Books, had been talking about Eden and kind of a broad concept of Eden and utopianism and these ideas of how the text was formed and a kind of general idea of how Eden exists in our imaginations came to be the book. Yeah. So I hope uh, uh, you all enjoyed what Bruce has to say. That's really my contribution here. Thank you, Ken, I appreciate that. The advertising of this session promised that I would talk about Eden as near. So I thought I should really begin with that so that we will not have engaged in false advertising. <laughs> How can you understand Eden as being near first? And then I want to explore the question, how if Eden is near, are we so far from it? Let me begin with the understanding of Eden's placement in a story which is not only pre-scientific before anything that we could refer to as science. It's also a text which is pre-philosophical in the sense that the major ideas of where the world is in the universe developed in Greek philosophy in the fifth century hadn't yet emerged. We're talking about a story which comes together 500 years before that. That's why I refer to this as being a ground level stage of the Bible. And therefore, in many ways, it's going to surprise us by the ways in which it characterizes us, the ways in which it characterizes God, whom the text continually calls Yahweh, gives him a personal name, gives him traits, gives him faults, gives him mistakes, not the way we usually think of the way the Bible speaks. And that's the purpose of the investigation, 
to permit this ground level of the Bible to articulate itself in its own terms. So let me begin with this issue of where Eden is. Within the imagination of this text, and by this text, I preeminently mean the book of Genesis, chapter 2. I don't mean chapter 1. Chapter 1 is like a preface. It was written later. And therefore, it also refers to ideas which are of a later period. We're looking at Genesis chapter 2 and the discussion of what is happening from Eden. In the imagination of these writers, a giant river flows from Eden in order to water the garden, the place where Adam and Chava live. I'll explain why I say Adam and Chava in just a moment. They're living in this wonderful garden. From that point, the river divides in four, so that it becomes the headwaters of the four great rivers of the world. And the text reads, and here I have just translated the Hebrew afresh to give you a living sense of it. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divides and becomes four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon, which goes all about the land of Hevila, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. And Bedellium and Onyx. The name of the second is Gihon. It goes about the land of Cush. The name of the third river is Rapid. It goes east of Assyria. The fourth river is Euphrates. Oh, thank God, one river we know. We know the Euphrates. Oh, but actually, we also know another river in this list. The other river we actually know is the one called Rapid, which in Greek is called the Tigris. And the river which is in the land of Cush is clearly the Nile. So we're only missing one river, and that's not really missing either. If only we lived in Saudi Arabia then we would know about a very large wadi called the Wadi al Hamid, which has the same role for Saudi Arabia that the Tigris and the Euphrates did for Mesopotamia. So in the imagination of these thinkers, there is some place that is the actual source of all the waters of the world as they themselves knew them. They describe not merely the world as it was in their minds in the distant past, but the world as it existed when they lived. As far as they are concerned, Eden is still causing the world to flourish. That's how near it is. It is constantly causing this characteristic flood that makes life possible. Now, we all know floods can get out of hand, and the book of Genesis will tell about that in the case of Noah. But flooding every spring in the Near East is crucial to fertility. How do you explain a river flooding when it's not raining? We can do that. Those who produced the vision of Eden thought of that as occurring from this great source of water, which is in Eden. And for it to accomplish that task, it must be above. It must be high. So that our inability to enter Eden is not simply a matter of space horizontal, but space vertical. And this conception that a paradise can be found from above, turns out to have influenced, of all people, Christopher Columbus. This is difficult to believe, so I'll be very careful to quote his logbook to you, so you understand how he was thinking. I'll preface my remark by observing Christopher Columbus was not right about this. 
but he was dedicated in his impression because he has read the book of Genesis carefully. His thinking is representative of its period in one respect, but his speculations about the location of Eden are worth looking at because they are aligned to where Eden was located in the mind of these writers who produced the story, whom scholars call the Yahwists, that is, those early oral storytellers who refer to God as Yahweh. In 1498, Columbus was making his third voyage, and he encountered off the coast of what we now call Venezuela, fresh water. As you know, he was not expecting another continent in front of him. That was the whole premise of his journey that he could get to China. Before he bumped into land, he bumped into fresh water, which you don't necessarily expect to find at sea. Ignorant of South America, he concluded that a huge torrent must be rolling in from paradise, from Eden. As he remarked, this is the part of the quotation, if the water of which I speak does not proceed from there, from the earthly paradise, the wonder is even greater because I do not believe that a river as big and deep is known anywhere else in the world. See, they hadn't discovered the Hudson River yet. <laughs> but seeing the fresh water led Columbus to believe that he had indeed identified the very source from which Eden was coming out far to the west of Israel because people had ex been expelled to the east of Eden. Although Columbus had succumbed to a geographical anachronism, he also saw that the Yahwists were not working with only two dimensions in their cosmology. They conceived of height as well as width and depth. For them, Eden and the garden occupied an enormous space and their waters roared in to make up the headwaters of every major known river. That meant that only an upward movement could bring people anywhere near to paradise and Eden, just the change Columbus had noted in his log of the voyage. So this conception of an Eden above and near is also involved in the understanding that this Eden is still supplying us. It is the fresh water source from which the whole earth is able to exist. I was reading the other day about the installation of the aqueducts from our part of the Hudson Valley to New York City. And in effect, they are replicating kind of artificial view of what is going on in the case of Eden. If you get high enough, you can run everything by the principle of a siphon. And in effect, the earth is a siphon served by Eden, the water source. But in that it is so fructifying and so pleasant, because the name Eden means pleasant, how come we are not there? Now we come to the story of sins. Note I say sins. I didn't say sin. There's just not one sin. This is a story about a series of mistakes that results in people not being in a place where there would have been no work. There would have been no pain in childbirth. There would have been no murder, but for, for what? Let me explain in advance that I'm going to disappoint some expectations. Wouldn't it be straightforward if there was just, you know, a devil 
who was responsible for everything, who was totally malevolent, and really no one else is culpable for this result. <coughs> Might be very nice if that's the case, and later Western theology and philosophy has often produced that result. But the devil never appears in the story. And the devil never appears in the book of Genesis. If you want the devil, you just have to wait for him later on in the development of the biblical tradition. Right now, we just have a snake. A very unusual snake, but a snake is all he's called. And we'll come to him in just a bit. Well, we don't have a devil. I hate to tell you too, despite all the expectations of my colleagues in the classics, we don't have an apple. <laughs> Word apple nowhere appears. We talk about the fruit of the tree, not the apple on the tree. And last, but far from least in its disappointment, I have to tell you, there is no sex involved. Errors are palpably errors. But insofar as they were sex, they were sex before and they were sex after, because after all, there was reproduction. So, although I have enormous esteem for St. Augustine, his conception of original sin and making this sin preeminently sexual, I think reveals more about his psychology than it does about the Bible. And if you don't believe me, just read his confessions at some time. That man has more to confess than any healthy human being would. And we all know what the confessions are about. So let's look at what these errors are that result in the expulsion from Eden. Starting with our good friend Adam, which I pronounce that way because that's what you say in Hebrew, and Adam simply means man. It just means person. It doesn't start life as a name of an individual. Because most of the figures in the book of Genesis are in fact archetypes. The story is investigating what is it to be a person and how did we foul up? Well, we all know he, what he ate and that it wasn't an apple. How does Yahweh find out about it? Well, Yahweh is walking about in the garden. Wait a minute, what? Yes, Yahweh is described as walking around in the garden. Why? He's enjoying the cool evening breeze. Wouldn't you? Yahweh is enjoying himself, but he's not omniscient because he notices, where's the dog? And he says, where are you? Right? He doesn't know in advance. Nor in advance does he know what has happened. Adam explains that he's hidden himself. He was afraid because he knew he was naked. Yahweh asks, who told you you were naked? Oh, the penny drops. Did you eat from the tree I commanded you not to eat? The shame Adam feels might have been considered adequate punishment in itself, but then Adam compounds his fault. He says, the woman you gave me alongside me, she gave me from the fruit and I ate. The woman follows suit by blaming the serpent. Yahweh cuts into further explanations by punishing all the characters. In this scene, the Yahwehs address one of the central themes in their epic as a whole, the qualities that Yahweh values and those that really irritate him. Yahweh's fierce response to Adam's attempt to shirk responsibility might seem extreme. After all, the experience of shame brings with it an awareness of one's guilt and therefore the reflex of covering it up, but exactly that covering up is what upsets Yahweh the most. In Eden, for the Yahweh, the worst failure is not disobedience, 
but not taking responsibility for the disobedience. It is when Adam shirks blame after eating the fruit that Yahweh reacts in anger. Because you have listened to the voice of your woman, that's what the text calls her at this stage, and ate from the tree that I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground, not you. Cursed is the ground because of you. By labor, you shall eat all the days of your life. It will sprout thorn and thistle, and you will eat the grass of field. By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. Since you were taken from it, so you are dust, and to dust you shall return. These opening words, because you have listened to the voice of your woman, obviously carry with them the assumption that males should be in a position of authority in relation to females, an aspect of the Yahweh's perspective that will be further emphasized by what Yahweh does to the woman herself. In addition, Yahweh calls attention to Adam's strange passivity. And this is a major point of the text that often goes unnoticed. The only person who has ever heard the command, don't eat from that tree, at this stage in the story, is Adam. Chava, Eve, had not been created yet. And Serpent was not on the scene either. Adam was the only one directly present when the commandment was given. And what does Adam do during the entire discussion between the snake and Chava? Adam does absolutely nothing. He's totally passive. Does not intervene in any way whatsoever. So there is a double catastrophic failure on Adam's part in terms of the passive inadvertence and then the deliberate attempt to evade responsibilities. It is not an open rebellion. It is just an indulgent passive mistake. Adam speaks once more in Genesis after the curse of the ground is pronounced but before the expulsion from the garden. He names the woman Chava, Eve in Hebrew. He also gives the reason for the name, because she was the mother of all chai, of all living things. So there is one catastrophic mistake in Eden. And another, a much more subtle error, is that of Chava, which comes her way for a reason also described within the text. Yahweh says to her, I'll replace your labor and your pregnancy. Childbearing becomes the issue, but here it is presented as labor, which is exactly the same word used in relation to the curse given to Adam, that is, he is going to have to farm the earth with labor. She has to labor to bring forth the flesh and blood from which she herself is made. And at the same time, the implication is that her pregnancy is lengthened. Clearly, the conception of the Hebrew is that it takes longer for a woman to gestate than other animals, which, of course, is both true and not true, depending on Yahweh is not through, though. He goes on. Your longing shall be for your man, and he will rule over you. Notice, the text does not say, although later texts do, that men were produced first and then women, and therefore men rule over women. You can hear this all over Ohio today. But they can't quote the book of Genesis to get that result. It doesn't happen there. What the text does say is that there's going to be a change in Eve's longing, which results in the ability of a man to dominate. 
this understanding of there being a change is because the word for longing in Hebrew is teshuka, which, which refers to an impulse of attachment, which makes a person desire something outside as if that thing could suffice to complete the inner sense of lack. In this sense, the Yahwists articulate a psychological insight by means of a seemingly naive narrative. The impulse of attachment is not part of Eve's original creation. It is caused by the eating of the fruit. The longing that will come and the desire that led to eating of the fruit co-mingle in the description of what made her reach out for the fruit. The woman, the text says, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and desirable to enlighten. She took from its fruit and ate and gave to her man and he ate. In this case, seeing involves much more than sight. In fact, the serpent has already told her that Yahweh prohibits eating from the fruit only because he knows that when she and her man eat it, their eyes will be opened. Even before the fateful punishments from Yahweh that are about to come, when opened, the eyes will discover shame rather than delight. What Eve sees that draws her to pick fruit from the tree is an amalgam of what her eyes tell her and the serpent's promise that she and Adam will be like gods, knowing good and evil if they eat. Those words and her senses entice Eve. What she hears and sees become completely entangled. Her desire reflects the obvious view of how emotion pulls us. The seeing of an object is absorbed into desires projected onto the object, and desire becomes a force that leads and controls our behavior. A sensation, a desire, or an aspiration may be good in itself, but when they are conflated, the narrative warns, the result is a disorientation that in this instance is catastrophic. Simply desiring the wrong thing, the ill-advised thing, can lead to estrangement. Well, how does this disorientation occur? Oh, at last he comes our good friend, the serpent, who does have a crucial role in this exact moment, and he's a different kind of character for the Yahwists. Those characters we've encountered so far, Adam, Eva, and in the text at this point, I include Cain and Abel, because I deal with them elsewhere in the book, are representatives of people whom the Yahwists and their hearers encountered as a matter of living reality. Adam, the man created from earth to till the earth, was reflected in every farmer active in the kingdoms of David, Solomon, and Rehoboam, the kings under whom and for whom the Yahwists worked. The vast majority of male Israelites farmed. So that Adam was not a mythic superhuman figure, but an archetype reflecting a lived reality. Similarly, Chava's description as mother of all living applied to every mother. Firstborn Cain but found a city that became a prototype for all cities, and his trade as a smith was characteristic of urban life. Just as shepherding flocks in the manner of Abel did not die with him, and sacrifices from the flock remained the form of worship that, according to the Yahwists, God himself preferred. That's what I mean by referring to all of these figures as archetypes. The story is different, however, when it comes to the case of the servant. He is not an archetype in the same sense. He is a figure that no longer exists in ordinary experience and is used in the story to explain how the present came to be in this way. The serpent's function is similar to that of the Greeks Prometheus, 
who gave humanity fire, and Rome's Liber, who provided vineyards, or the Egyptian Osiris, who was raised from the dead to become king of the underworld. The result was that people could enjoy fire and wine and trust their dead to divine protection without anticipating meeting up with Prometheus, Liber, or Osiris. These are mythic figures for that reason, and they explain current reality, but are not the same as being part of it. The Yahwists treat the serpent in exactly this sense, speaking of a being that no longer exists as it is described, but which explains why snakes, as we can see them, look as they do, as well as how they are treated, and most crucially, how human beings took the fateful step into self-consciousness and knowledge. The Yahwists begin their myth-making by saying, the serpent was smarter than any being of the field that Yahweh had made. He said to the woman, well, even before he says anything, the very fact, the fact that he speaks is kind of stunning, since beforehand, who has spoken? Yahweh speaks. Adam speaks, and he's a very important figure. Adam gives names. And the same story to every creature on the earth. He is a linguistic creator and is part of creation in that sense. It's the other side of Adam and why he's so curiously passive in the encounter with the servant. Who else has spoken? Herava, as it turns out, is going to speak. And now the serpent is going to speak. And what the serpent does with language turns out to be crucially important. He said to the woman, has God really said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Of course, anyone who knows the story that the Yahwists have just recounted will understand the serpent's statement is a gross distortion. Since God had in fact said to Adam, you shall indeed eat from every tree of the garden. In falsifying Yahweh's position, the serpent also uses the plural form of you. Hebrew allows you to distinguish between singular and plural. So Yahweh had said to Adam, don't you do this. And already the serpent is quoting it as a plural, as a generalized statement. That, of course, was also not the when Yahweh instructed Adam about the knowledge tree, neither the serpent nor Eve had yet been created. Part of the skill of the Yahweh's narrative is the way it shows us that language can be deceptive, in this case, deliberately deceptive. The clear command to Adam is muddled in the serpent's quotation to Eve, and the implication is that the distortion is far from innocent. Eve, as a matter of fact, initially rises to the challenge with, with force and accuracy. The woman said, from the truth of the tree of the garden, we shall eat. But again, you see, she's paraphrasing. She rightly corrects the servant about Yahweh's command, referring to trees collectively, with the singular term tree, and does not at first quote Yahweh, whom she had not directly heard. She speaks of what we shall do on the basis of an understanding she had with Adam. As she replies to the serpent, however, she also and innovatively refers to the fruit of the tree, not simply the tree. She shifts attention from the nature of the tree itself to the appearance of fruit. That will prove to have a fateful outcome as events unfold. At base, though, Eve, at this stage, plays the role of calling positive attention to one of the Yahwist's principal themes, of which the serpent is a negative example. Language can be used to corrupt reality. As she responds to the serpent's question, Eve adds to Yahweh's prohibition. Again, quoting him directly, although not knowing. She says, as if it were part of the command, and you shall not touch it. 
the Ava and never said that. Not approaching the knowledge tree might seem a wise precaution, since it was not to be used for food. But Yahweh had not said that to Adam. The Yahweh's audience might have imagined Adam relating Yahweh's command to Chava, adding such a prohibition, but in any case, it is an addition. And it has the paradoxical impact of weakening the force of the command. After all, during the discussion with the serpent, Eve will approach the tree and admire the fruit that her own words have called attention to and touch it, all without suffering any harm whatsoever. That would seem to support the insistence of the serpent that eating the fruit will also not be harmful. He will even say that eating the fruit will vastly improve the human condition. The skill of the serpent's deceit lies in its distortion of language. He not only exemplifies distortion in his own statements, but also produces distortions when Eve correctly corrects his lie. The R was here warned about the capacity of language to garble memory and to manufacture erroneous perceptions. Their audience knows very well that the serpent and Eve never spoke with Yahweh personally about the knowledge tree, but here they are both quoting him with a confident authority whose certainly, certainty will prove disastrous. Indeed, the more they claim direct acquaintance with Yahweh's words, intentionally or not, the more wrong they are. And that feeds into the serpent's argument that if you only eat this thing, then you will be like God's knowing good and evil. The claim would not have worked out without its prelogue in the discussion between Eve and the serpent, but now she is prompted to look at the fruit, desire it, take and eat it, and give it to Adam, who again, you remember, has not absolutely nothing during this exchange. Until this point, the serpent has proved smart, but also deceptive. He embodies the possibility of language to corrupt us and take us apart from our actual origins as human beings. Perhaps that's a good thing to keep aware of during a presidential campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming today. I haven't done badly with time, so if, if, if people would like to comment or question or object, or if Sam has anything to add, we could be happy to entertain that right now. Refreshments and... Oh, refreshments. Tell us, will you tell us about the refreshments? Prepared by uh, Tom Palazzo for our baking, and, um, and then we have a book set, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. That's right. Excellent, fantastic. So I think people should feel free to migrate as, as we entertain any, any further discussion. Some will be hungry. There is food there. Some will be hungry. And it's right there, I see it. Yes, please. I got a copy of your book. Some of it I understand, some of it I do not yet understand. Did I understand you to say that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were vegetarians, but it was only when they were kicked out is when they became meat eaters. Indeed, and it took years. And it wasn't immediate. In other words, this picture of an original vegetarianism was recognized from a very early period in discussion of the biblical text. Uh, even before the time that we began to speak of the Yahwists as a group, which is basically a 19th century innovation. But still, it's innovation which has lasted for quite a long time now and explains a great deal about the text. But even before there was thought of that, there was the recognition that, initially speaking, you 
did not routinely kill animals for food. And that <coughs> is only presented as part of the intention of the created order in the time after the flood <coughs> associated with Noah. Mm. At that stage, you begin to get a regular understanding that because of this successful sacrificial enterprise to worship God, God was also granting to human beings the right to enjoy meat. That's exactly <coughs> the case. Uh, and indeed, it's part of recent discussion of what is called green theology. That is, if the picture of Eden is one of a ecological balance in which, as you've seen, people don't have to work, right? That there's no farming, there's only gathering. And this gathering is of fruit and vegetables. We could argue the case of nuts. They aren't referred to. But the Talmud discusses it anyway. <laughs> something not referred to is just an opportunity to imagine. Uh, so there is very much that picture of Eden being a place of pleasure which is in balance. And part of that balance uh, does not include <coughs> And it's interesting that uh, I couldn't get into it here, but it's in the book that the first murder mm -hmm. occurs because of jealousy that those who herd lambs and then offer of lambs to Yahweh get Yahweh's favor more than people who are offering from the produce of the land. So you have the understanding, which again, I'm not defending historically, but the understanding of the text is Animals were sacrifices before they were food. And they become food only after the crisis represented by the great flood of Noah. Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that's a good observation. And what's interesting is that this view of meat eating coming later is present not only in this very early source, by the Yahwist is the 10th century for the common era. An enormously interesting. If it had no part uh, to play in the Bible at all, it would still be fascinating just for its age. And part of my argument is it deserves a hearing in its own terms, the way in which it develops its context. It sees the matter this way, but also sources of the Bible which came in at a later time also agree with this picture. So it's really quite a, not quite what we expect. You know, the, this is not the picture of primitive culture that we would get if we were guided by American cinema. You know, they're not running around killing mammoths or anything like them. They're picking fruit. Yes, please. When I was a very small boy, a few years ago, and, and I heard this story for the first time. I was so intrigued with it. And this thought occurred to me, and from time to time it's recurred. And the thought was, what if they had eaten from the tree of life mm. instead of the tree of knowledge? The mind just spins on this. Mm. And what if they had? That is, what if the understanding was, as long as they were going to be in Eden, how would they know whether they were eating from the tree of life or not? He never said not to eat from that tree. The tree of life, this goes back to Ken's observation, the tree of life only becomes an issue as separate from the tree of knowledge. When Yahweh has another one of these penny-dropping moments, that is, he has seen what's happened in the garden. He is punished, Adam, Chava, and poor serpent. I mean, he gets, he's the only one, it's interesting, serpent is the only one who's directly cursed. Adam has the ground cursed because of what he did. Chava has the pain of childbirth. But, you know, there's another modern association that doesn't make it at all into the text. You know, the idea of menstruation as a curse 
just not present, not an issue. It's interesting that we have certain obsessions, the text does not. Anyway, it's only after judgment is given on this figure that Yahweh then says to himself, and now what is going to happen? They know they're like us. Yahweh uses the plural of divinity, like the plural of majesty. They have become like us, knowing good and evil. And now, if they go and eat from the tree of oh, he has to expel them. So part of the issue is Yahweh's jealousy. You know, when the text says, I, the Lord thy God, and a jealous God, it's not kidding around. But also notice that in this picture of Yahweh, Yahweh did not anticipate the text is actually insistent in portraying Yahweh not as being constantly stable and all-knowing and unchanging, but as being himself on a learning curve. You know, it's a different conception of divinity from what we have and from what is present elsewhere in the biblical text. But while they were in Eden, I guess they would have lived forever. There was not, nothing to, because the text doesn't tell us, would you have to eat the tree of life just once? You don't drink water from Eden just once. I mean, the understanding is all of our water comes from Eden. That's why it's pure. That's why it's fresh. You don't just drink once. So presumably the picture of the tree of life is that you would need it on a regular basis. Yes, please. You started off talking about being close to Eden. Could you say more about that? Yeah, the closeness of Eden, I think, first of all, is in the sense of the Yahwists, physical proximity. It is as near to you as your closest source of fresh water. That Eden is providing all of that in their understanding of how the cosmos works. Of course, it's a smaller cosmos. I mean, they openly say it's all the rivers of the world. Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Near East, and what we would call Saudi Arabia. That is the world, as far as they are concerned. The horizon only extends that far. When I was reading from Columbus, it's because Columbus was actively stretching the world but at the same time, using the text of Genesis to understand our world in terms of paradise. So paradise is near us in the sense that paradise remains our source. Even as we cannot get into it, and our failure to get into it is because of what people do. People are like Adam to pass it. People are like Chava, led by ill-considered desires. And people are victims of manipulated language. So in a sense, the, the text is also explaining what a return to Eden would involve. And making that project rather more straightforward than it is if you think, again, I'm going to beat up my good friend, St. Augustine, you know, if, if you believe that all of human nature changed in the garden, if that's what you think, then the corrupted nature cannot return to Eden. In the understanding of the Yahwists, what was corrupt was behavior. And behavior can be changed. Yes, please. Thank you for coming. Ah, well, Don is for me to thank you. <laughs> it's a, this a specific piece of uh, forbidden fruit, did that contain any specific qualities or powers, that piece of fruit? The identity of the fruit has been a frequent issue of discussion. As I say, in the modern period, 
classicists love to say it's apples. And so I remember my mother telling me that my Adam's apple <laughs> right, is there because when Adam ate from the fruit, a piece of the apple caught in his throat. I was so disappointed when I went to Sunday school and I could not find any sign of this source of the Adam's apple. And uh, at least it would also explain why men have larger Adam's apples. Anyway, uh, so that doesn't appear to work out. A fig has often been put forward as a candidate uh, on the grounds that it really is quite a nice looking fruit and uh, tastes good, it's sweet. But the one that I think uh, is much more likely is the pomegranate because the pomegranate, which is explored in rabbinic literature, but again, rabbinic literature, much later period, I'm not saying it was in the minds of the Yahwists, I'm just saying it's really much more plausible than, you know, a Topps apple. I don't think so, it's something <laughs> splendid. And so, and the variety of the qualities in the pomegranate, I think, suggests it to that degree. But having said all that, I don't believe that there's any attempt on the part of the writers to specify what fruit, because just as in the case of the tree of life, you can't really say what fruit is it gives you life. Uh, likewise, you can't say which fruit gives you knowledge. Uh, it's sort of unlike water. You know you need water for life. You don't know what fruit is going to give you knowledge or life. But the promise of the text is if you were in Eden, you would. You know, Eden would give you this knowledge. One of the interesting implications of the text is that there is a powerful difference between knowledge that comes to us in order to be used which it is assumed in the text is knowledge that human beings simply have to deploy. And as I said, Adam himself contributes to this knowledge quite notably. Distinction between that kind of knowledge, the knowledge that leads you to actions, and knowledge in the abstract, which in the understanding of the text leads to shame. Now, something I didn't discuss, it's elsewhere uh, in the text, is the nature of shame and why shame is understood to be associated with knowledge and yet is not the same thing as knowledge. That's another question. Sure. The Yahwist's view of God is an evolving, evolving uh, entity, right? Is that not corroborating what Moses when when God uh, when Moses asked, "What's your name? Who sent me?" It's the same concept. So even later, it was carried out. Even later, and of course, what Moses is showing us in that scene, this is the book, the story, the book of Exodus, when Moses asks the name of God, clearly supposing that no one knows the name of God, and so. God then says, my name is Yahweh. He explains why he calls that. He's called that. He says, because it means, I shall become what I shall become. Tell them, I, Yahweh, sent you. Well, that's an alternative for you. Instead of everyone knowing Yahweh's name from the outset, in this later source, it's only disclosed to Moses. But you're right, it still presupposes that God, over time, does different things. God adjusts to deal with <clears throat> behavior. In that sense, the picture of God is that it's not static, but in fact, dynamic. There was, yes please, Jane. Um, so, they ate from the, the tree of, and had knowledge of good and evil, but other than shame, what, what other consequences did they? Did that was it. I mean, and prior, exactly prior to this change, 
the text refers to their being naked and not being ashamed. And then they're ashamed, right. so they decide not to be naked. And that's what tips Yahweh off, right. that something has gone badly amiss. I think the text <laughs> could lead you to think that Yahweh would have been happy leaving them with their shame and saying, so there. See what you've done? That's why I told you. It's sound parental, don't I? That's why I told you not to do that. Now those are the consequences. But in fact, Yahweh goes beyond that when the two of them deny their responsibility. That's what I find interesting. In both cases, there's a two-stage effect. One direct, uh, the other because Yahweh becomes upset by their, their action. It's not it's, the crime, it's the cover-up. It's, it's the cover-up. <laughs> Is the cover-up actually worse than the crime? It could be. There is another story that occurs much later on in the Yahwist's epic that talks about the king whom David replaced, King Saul. Saul talks almost like Adam at the crucial moment where he was commanded by the prophet Samuel to wait the coming of Samuel before offering sacrifice to Yahweh. Saul doesn't. Saul takes on prophetic tasks himself. It's a bad error. But what's worse than that is, when confronted with his error by the prophet Samuel, Saul says to him, the people forced me, that's why I did it. I was just following their will. Then, at that moment, Samuel, who had anointed Saul to be king, said, you are no longer king. That was the, they, they, it's a kind of bookend to what's going on in the case of Eden. And it's vitally important for the Davidic epic because David is the exact opposite of this. David gets up to an extraordinary amount of mischief, but he doesn't cover up. His reaction is to repent. Yahweh really likes that. And I think this, this is part of the message of the Yahwists. Steve. Yeah, um, the tree of life theme, that, that appears throughout the Bible, right? And even in the New Testament, it ends with the tree of life. And there's eating of the tree of life idea. And can you elaborate? Because I know that I see it sometimes in Christian theology and sometimes in Christian sacramental theology. Mm -hmm. and all of that. So uh, it's a big question, but there you go. It's a big question, but I think it is a vital one because it also uh, touches on why the canon of the Bible with the New Testament is shaped the way it is. Uh, because the revelation to John closes with a climactic image of the tree of life appearing on earth as part of the New Jerusalem. And of course, that has to occur because the New Jerusalem comes down from heaven. Oh, we seem to have the same location as Eden in the Yahweh's understanding. And in fact, there are many cases within the Hebrew Bible and also in rabbinic literature when it's understood that the temple in Jerusalem, when it stood, was an artificial representation of Eden. So the two menorah are the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. The conception is when people are worshiping properly, they are as close to Eden as you can be. That was part of the justification of the temple in Jerusalem. But in the Revelation to John, written after that temple had been destroyed by the Romans, the picture is of 
the tree of life, the new Jerusalem being lowered from heaven to earth. And then the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. That is, that's eternal life. It's the free access again to the tree of life. Well then, this also touches on this question of God readjusting. It was he who said, they're not getting that tree. And then in the revelation to John, it's provided. So I would say the revelation to John is in fact a deliberate, symmetrical bookend to what's happening in the story of Eden. How is that then connected with the Messiah? I, I see there's a connection. Mm -hmm. In the revelation to John, the function of the Messiah uh, is twofold. Uh, on the one hand, it's to bring about this restoration where Jerusalem can be lowered down. So the Messiah, in the understanding of Revelation to John, takes place in an actual angelic battle to permit this to occur. But in addition to that, the opening section of the Revelation to John portrays Jesus as being the Lamb who was slain. So the understanding is that his willingness to be the sacrifice, not really to offer the sacrifice, is a part of this realization. Well, thank you very much for coming.